fixation is delayed and thereby the action potential duration is prolonged. So this is the class 3 mechanism. Class 4 is the calcium channel mechanism. Nothing but diltiasm and verapam mill. This calcium influx which is in phase 2 is going to be affected here. So just we remember what channel, ion channel is affected in each molecule and then we can easily remember the effects of the particular class of drug. So this is group 1 drug acts on the phase 0. It can also affect the potassium channel to a certain extent, whereby it is divided into group 1A, 1B and 1C. So when it reduces the action potential duration, it is 1B. When it increases the action potential duration, it is 1A. So there is some subtle subtype as well. And group 3 is predominantly prolonging the action potential duration. You can see this is blue one is normal action potential duration. And when group 3 drugs act, it prolongs the action potential duration, which are nothing but potassium channel blockers. Coming to the group 4 action calcium channel blockers, this is again predominantly blocks the calcium channels, which is playing a very major role in the phase 2 of the action potential. Coming to the modern classification, which is published by Lay et al., published in 2018, the centenary birth year to honor uh, Wagen Williams. They retained the basic structure, but still added a uh, scope for entry of new molecules. A lot of new molecules have come. So, 1, 3, 2, 4, all the three they have retained. But they have added class 0, which is hexane modulators, nothing but IF, IF, funny current modulators. Then class 5 is mechanosensitive channels. And class 6 is gap junction modulators. And class 7 is upstream modulators. I'll just add upon on the other newer classes alone. HCN is nothing but funny current uh, blockers, which is nothing but the classical example is Ivabradin molecule. Mechanosensitive channel and gap junction are research molecules, no clinically useful drug currently available. And class 7 upstream target modulators, nothing but AC inhibitors, ARBs, statins and omega-3 fatty acids. These four group of molecules, the substrate is modified so that arrhythmia risk is reduced. So hence they have added it under the class of antiarrhythmics. This is class 7 upstream target modulators. So class 1, class 0 is HCN funny current, class 1 is sodium, class 2 is beta blockers, class 3 is potassium, class 4 is all these blue calcium related uh, events, class 3 is mechanosensitive thing, and class 6 is gap junction or connection related and class 7 is upstream modulators. This is all about the newer classification as well. We'll move on to topic per se. What is the role in pre-op assessment? I have covered with pre-op, peri-op, pastulous, post-op and ICU setting. So in pre-op, arrhythmias do occur in majority of acute surgical illness. But that should not differ the urgent surgical procedure in any situation. When surgery is an emergency, it's always an emergency and it is indicated. Arrhythmia, unless it is life-threatening, we don't give much importance to it. Life-threatening arrhythmias, obviously, it will be given preference. But routine, simple, small AF with control rate, we don't think much about it. Some frequent VPCs, we ignore it. We need to document with a 12 DCG and do a detailed cardiac evaluation. Prevention of potential triggers is always crucial. So whenever you have an arrhythmic substrate, Maintain electrolytes, acid bases in appropriate levels. Try to avoid ischemia as much as possible. Avoid volume mode status and hyper hyperactivity of the autonomic nervous system. So these things should be kept adequate. Sedation should be given in those patients. Pain relief should also be adequate. We should always try to avoid a trigger in these individuals. Patient already taking AADs, they should not stop taking these drugs. They should continue to take these AADs during the period period as well because stopping them can increase the risk of post-op arrhythmias in these individuals. High risk for malignant arrhythmias, always they should have continuous cardiac monitoring. So class 1 recommendation, we have to continue to use the drug to whichever the patient was already on in the period period as well. And whenever there is an hemodynamic instability, cardioversion should be done and then particularly the patient should be stabilized and then taken up. And whenever Symptomatic ventricular arrhythmias are there. Before the surgical procedure, try to treat the ventricular arrhythmias and ablation of arrhythmias is recommended even before a elective non-cardiac surgery. And definitely asymptomatic VPCs should not be treated. It is a class 3 recommendation. Coming to the diagnosis, this is most, most very important step. You should know what is a false alarm and what is a true arrhythmia. So many times movement artifacts are there in ICU and uh, sometimes we consider it as false uh, uh, alarm and uh, we should know whether it is false alarm or a true arrhythmia. Documentation is must. Unless it is a cardiac emergency, unless it is an ACLS situation or a code blue situation, always take a 12 DCG or a rhythm strip before treating the arrhythmia. Many times we see in the monitor and then give therapy to the arrhythmia, but without knowing what arrhythmia actually it is. Monitors are not always uh, completely informative and 12 DCG or rhythm strip is the one which can help us to diagnose arrhythmia and treat. So it's, it should always be done. Documentation most important. 
if it is a cold blue situation that's a different scenario i am talking about other ways uh, otherwise which is not a cold blue situation telemetry always indicated in pre existing arrhythmia and high risk patient onset of arrhythmia and termination should be documented if possible something continuously put him put him put them on the rhythm strip and do so that we will know how the arrhythmia gets terminated and sustained vt obviously implication of prognosis is poor and bradyarrhythmia arrhythmias also we need to identify and treat so risk factors and incidence acute medical conditions are there and acute surgical conditions are there sepsis acute respiratory insufficiency acute kidney injury brain injury cancer related problems and acute surgical causes like trauma burns non cardiac surgery all this can precipitate arrhythmias coming to sepsis obviously increase incidence is there more than 30% is there underlying cause should always be treated and supraventricular arrhythmias are more common than ventricular arrhythmias in respiratory insufficiency pneumonia and atelectasis are the most common causes and in copd af or multifocal atrial tachycardia is the most common one whenever vf is present it indicates poor prognosis in acute respiratory insufficiency acute kidney injury the mortality is doubled the incidence of arrhythmias is also doubled than compared to a patient with a normal renal function and dosing of aid is need to be given more importance in such situations with aka brain injury 90% ecg changes will be there prolonged qt is a common thing sct changes are common and 25 to 30% patients have arrhythmias stroke and sih are the most common precipitating factors cancer disease per se can trigger arrhythmia chemotherapy radiotherapy can trigger arrhythmia and implanted devices can go in for dysfunction whenever patient goes for prolonged uh, radiotherapy especially in the breast cancer wherein the device is implanted so this is regarding acute medical and acute surgical trauma uh, triggers like burns and trauma very very important fluid overload in a burns patient can trigger arrhythmia so it's again one of the important thing and generally they tend to recover spontaneously incidence is af more common with 5 to 15% incidence sepsis aki all can coexist in burns and trauma whenever we think of an arrhythmia following trauma always think of myocardial contusion as well as a cause of arrhythmia electrical injuries can also trigger arrhythmias non cardiac surgery incidence around 4 to 20% af is the most common one 2 to 3 days post op is usually uh, it's happening and thoracic surgery is the most common most, most common one coming to cardiac surgery 30 to 50% it is uh, af and 1 uh, to 5 days is the usual incidence and complex cardiac surgery involving valve with cabg the incidence is more longer aortic clamp time the incidence is more vital valve surgeries the incidence is more so surgery very big stress increased sympathetic tone can result in post op af ischemias can augment and result in post op af and any things that changes the myocardial uh, uh, stretch can also prevent that is the reason why hypervolemia stretches the atria and precipitates post op af coming to the acute and mid term management supportive therapy definitely indicated many patients will receive uh, recover uh, i mean require resuscitative care as well but diagnosis should be confirmed and if the patient is in unstable hemodynamics dc version is the treatment of choice with stable hemodynamics you can go into the specific treatment i'll come to the algorithm next and after stabilization always cause should be addressed if the patient is unresponsive not breathing this is a cold blue situation the entire acls protocol shockable rhythm non shockable rhythm all those stuff can be absolutely carried out as acls protocol if the patient is otherwise okay but hemodynamically unstable then elective dc shock is given in such situation amidorone is always indicated in such situation 300 mg iv over 10 to 20 minutes and repeated followed by repeat shock because pre treatment with amidorone increases the chance of cardioversion and otherwise if the patient is not hemodynamically unstable otherwise hemodynamically stable situation i'll come to the next algorithm always we should try to identify the reversible causes and treat the various hts we know we have to identify and treat them so i'll discuss with respect to atrial fibrillation and then svt and then vt so atrial fibrillation obviously higher ventricular rates and rot of loss of atrial kick those two things are responsible for the hemodynamic deterioration and whenever there is hemodynamic deterioration dc cardioversion is needed sedation appropriate intubation if aspiration risk is there otherwise we can go ahead antro posterior uh, lead placement is superior than the later lead placement and biphasic is always superior than the monophasic 200 joules is the number we need to remember and pre treatment with the anti arrhythmics especially amidorone facilitates dc version and generally in critically ill situations the success rate is low because the cause is not treated so it's otherwise in a routine op setup if you see immediately they will get cardioverted but here the cause is not treated if the patient is critically ill continue to be critically ill so success rate is only 30 to uh, 40% and he need to continue anti arrhythmic agents in these individuals so new onset reversible manifestation more than 50% it reverses in 72 hours 
stable hemodynamics rate control versus rhythm control so beta blockers calcium channel blockers digoxin a b c d beta blockers calcium channel blockers and digoxin all these three are used for rate control a is for rhythm control amiodarone and magnesium is also used for pharmacological cardioversion and always in post cardiac surgery situation amiodarone and beta blockers they goes to are the commonly used one whenever there is lv dysfunction or hypotension situation we will avoid beta blocker and prefer amiodarone in this situation and always rate control versus rhythm control is a big argument and initially we always try rate control and if the patient is still hemodynamically unstable we can think about rhythm control if in acute af situations and very lenient versus strict is all when if the patient is otherwise asymptomatic we should not be that aggressive and thrombophlebitis is always indicated whether it is paroxysmal or non paroxysmal whether it is rate or rhythm control therapy is followed always you should think about thrombophlebitis but the biggest challenge will be thrombocytopenia bleeding risk or invasive procedures are always there and atrial flutter is similar to atrial fibrillation but only thing is low energy dc cardioversion is used in this situation ventricular tachycardia supraventricular tachycardia either because of atomicity or reentry avnrt av nodal reentry tachycardia avrt or pgrt the common ones simple vagal maneuvers will stop avnrt and avrt if it is not getting stopped it is usually atrial tachycardia intravenous drugs iv adenosine 6 mg bolus subsequently if we want to repeat it we can repeat with two doses of 12 mg if necessary and iv calcium channel blockers like dtsm or mil and iv beta blockers are also used in this situation svt with aberrancy versus svt this difference is very very important if you are not able to differentiate obviously we should always treat it as svt unless otherwise it's proved to be svt amiodarone is preferred in patients with impaired ejection fraction and cardioversion if unstable hemodynamics is there so this is the narrow qvr tachycardia versus wide qvr tachycardia in a hemodynamically stable patient think whether it is regular or irregular regular p is very clear it is sinus if p is unclear it's either avnrt or avrt or at af so vagal maneuvers will stop avnrt or avrt vagal maneuvers will not stop atrial tachycardia or atrial flutter or sinus tachycardia so based on this you can differentiate them coming to white qvr tachycardia it is irregular more likely polymorphicity and if it is regular one is to one relationship if it is present always think about a ventricular tachycardia you should always analyze the bundle branch block pattern the entire thing is discussed by a brugada criteria and it is out of scope of discussion it's rbb typical versus atypical pattern if atypical pattern is there it suggests a ventricular tachycardia ventricular rate is more than atrial rate it again suggests a ventricular tachycardia newly diagnosed af acute management is always clinical assessment and anticoagulation and stable always dc cardioversion in stable two point comes here rate control versus rhythm control rate control b c and d beta blocker calcium channel blocker and digoxin amiodarone is also used for rhythm rate control but ideally it is a drug of choice for rhythm control as well as class 1c agents if follow up after icu care try to identify the cause and treat the cause you should always think about anticoagulation whenever the risk of bleeding is low we have to think of anticoagulation when risk of stroke is more again we have to think of anticoagulation and long term therapy is indicated ventricular premature complexes and non sustained vt if it is isolated less risky ppcs and nsvt we need not be very aggressive only when the patient has hemodynamic instability we will think about correction of causes whereas ventricular tachycardia if it is sustained monomorphic vt mortality is more 50% prior infarction vt is more likely if it is unstable 200 joules biphasic shock is always necessary sedation is required in an i awake patient and risk stratification and then if the patient needs icd implantation we have to go ahead with icd implantation ventricular fibrillation immediate defibrillation is done amiodarone is given after 2 to 3 shocks post amiodarone also we can try reverting the patient again and may require vasopressors with abp and all the other hemodynamic support and torsodicity point is qt prolongation is the commonest cause If QT prolongation is not the ischemia and severe aortic dissection, we should always think about isoproteinolol may be useful in these situations. And coming to ventricular arrhythmias, which is incessant VT and electric storm, if it is persist more than 12 hours, we call it as incessant VT or electric storm. More than three times in 24 hours, requiring interventions. That is also again incessant VT or electric storm. We should think about ongoing ischemia and try to correct the correctable causes. Mostly, the patient will not give more than 12 hours to 24 hours. Meanwhile, they will succumb to the ventricular tachycardia. and pro arrhythmia should always be considered in this individual so the patients are already on anti arrhythmic agents and coming to the ventricular arrhythmias unstable directly it is electrical cardioversion or defibrillation stable pv uh, uh, ventricular premature contractions and non sustained vt asymptomatic don't do anything symptomatic beta blocker and lignocaine 
sustained ventricular tachycardia amiodarone is a treatment of choice you can think about procaine amide and lidocaine or finally electrical cardioversion vf obviously it is defibrillation persistent ventricular tachycardia or paroxysmal ventricular tachycardia with torsor destroy some polymorphic ventricular tachycardia with torsor dist point is electrical electrolyte correction magnesium isoprotenolol temporary pacing if qtc is normal always think for ischemia so in torsor dist point is with normal qtc think about ischemia always incessant ventricular tachycardia and electric storm ischemia electrolyte abnormalities and proarrhythmic agents always defibrillation combined with antiarrhythmic drug is the treatment of choice in this approach. so common drug Amidorone, 150 mg over 10 minutes, 1 mg per minute, 60 mg, 6 hours, and then 30 mg, 18 hours. And maintenance dose is again 30 mg per hour. This is the commonest one. And metoprolol, again 2.5 mg or 5 mg over 1 to 2 minutes, can be repeated up to 15 mg over 15 minutes time. Verapamil and DLTSM are uh, doses 0.25 and 0 0.075 to 1.5. So all these things we can remember. These are the commonly available drugs. Amidorone, Metoprolol, diltiasm, verapamil are commonly available agents in the management of all these arrhythmias. Coming to some anticoagulation issues, post-operative AF, which is prolonged for more than 48 hours or longer, obviously they need anticoagulation. If with warfarin, 2 to 3 INR level, novel anti oral anticoagulations like uh, Davigatron or can be indicated. And three weeks prior to cardioversion and four weeks after cardioversion, it is definitely required. So even though it is a temporary post-operative AF, these patients require anticoagulation for at least four weeks. Coming to the pacing and devices, in patients with acute myocarditis or pancarditis, presence of high degree IV block, presence of symptomatic bradycardia, presence of bradycardia different ventricular arrhythmias. All these three things, they require pacing, temporary pacing support. Patients with cardiac surgery or TAVI or heart transplantation surgery, symptomatic sinus node dysfunction or symptomatic AV nodal dysfunction, both these things, they require pacing. So it's myocarditis and pericarditis or pancarditis, cardiac surgery, TAVI and heart transplant. In all these subset, significant symptomatic high degree blocks and sinus node dysfunction, they require pacing. And long term follow, risk of stroke, heart failure and mortality definitely is more in these patients who developed AF in critically ill situation than patients without AF. So obviously these patients should be followed up for long term, followed up for precipitation or recurrences of AF in these individuals or arrhythmias in these individuals and they should be treated and evaluated appropriately. Similarly, any patient with ventricular tachyarrhythmias, a complete cardiac evaluation to assess the cause of ventricular arrhythmia is always indicated and patients should be appropriately treated and appropriately managed based upon the risk factor which these patients have. To summarize the discussion, conduction system is a specialized tissue. Atria or ventricular are completely insulated from each other apart from AV node and his bundle. So obvious AV node and his bundle is the only way through which atria can depolarize the ventricle. So it propagates in a particular fashion. Sinus node is the pacemaker cell and it generates impulse and propagates to the adjacent cells. It reaches via the conduction system to the entire myocardium. So the generation is from the AV node. Propagation occurs through, a, uh, from the SA node, propagation occurs through from the AV node is bundle. And you need to remember, it is always from endocardium to epicardium it is the direction in which the current travels. And we should always remember, it is from the apex to the base the current travels. So these are the two important things regarding potential generation and propagation. Arrhythmia mechanisms, automaticity, triggered activity, and re-entry circuit. Coming to the anti-arrhythmic drug classification, it's older one, class one, class two, class three, class four. Class one is sodium, class two is beta blocker, class three is potassium channel blocker, class four is calcium channel blocker. And to this, we have added four, five more, uh, three more things to become eight. So class zero is nothing but uh, HCN or funny current evaporating. That is a molecule for class zero. And uh, class five and six are not commonly used ones. So mechanosensitive channels and connection related channels. And class 7 is uh, upstream mo molecules like AC inhibitor, uh, ARB and statins and uh, omega-3 fatty acid molecules. Coming to the pre-op care, in pre-op assessment, we have to identify the risk factor for arrhythmia and those patients should be monitored properly. Diagnosis is more important. Documentation is very important. Any patients with risk factors, we should carefully follow for onset of arrhythmias and treatment of appropriate arrhythmias whenever the hemodynamic compromise occurs. Acute and midterm management, if unstable, single answer is DC cardioversion as much as possible and then pharmacological cardioversion whenever it is indicated. When the patient is stable, look for the arrhythmia type 
atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation appropriately managed, ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation appropriately we have to manage. Single drug, if you want to answer here, amandurone is a single drug of choice. Entire discussion for 30 minutes and finally, if you want one answer, I will give two words. One is DC cardioversion if unstable, if stable amidarone. That is the simplest uh, message which we can take from this lesson, uh, this uh, session. Anticoagulation obviously have issues because of trauma and bleeding related issues. Pacing and devices definitely we need to consider in a high risk situation with symptomatic bradycardia, both involving SA node as well as AV node. And long term follow up, these patients have increased risk of atrial fibrillation and ventricular arrhythmias. So the risk factors should always be identified and treated appropriately. And with this, I would like to uh, summarize my session with uh, big thanks to the entire online anesthesia platform, to its chief editor, sir, and associate editors and session coordinator, ma'am, as well as everyone who have patiently listened to this. Whenever given an opportunity, I will be happy to see you all again. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Ishwaran, sir. That was an intense uh, topic and you've covered an enormous topic within uh, your, space, your uh, time. I have uh, one question to you, sir. Uh, when we have arrhythmias associated or uh, dyselectrolytemia and arrhythmias, so uh, how difficult, like uh, how in your experience, uh, how difficult or how easy is it to treat and how should we go about so obviously, which is a common, uh, yes, ma'am. As you said, it is one of the precipitating factor in most of the situation. So, dyselectrolemia is the most important precipitating factor for all uh, arrhythmias, especially post of AF, POAF, post of atrial fibrillation. And these patients, we have to parallelly correct the dyselectrolemia along with the correction of uh, arrhythmia with either antiarrhythmic drug or whatever uh, therapy. So that is the reason I have also mentioned that uh, cardioversion in these patients who have only 30 to 40 percent success rate because background dyselectrolemia will be there. So simple shock will not correct all problems. Shock will temporarily correct immediately. It will revert back to the AF. We have done it many times with futile attempts. Two, three shocks we have tried and still the patient won't revert to sinus rhythm. Finally, put them on amidron infusion for 24 hours along with that correct whatever electrolyte abnormality is there. That is the way to go. And uh, obviously, it should be corrected along with antiarrhythmic agents. Okay. Yeah, have you ever come across any difficult uh, uh, patients where you uh, found it very difficult to revert back to normal sinus rhythm? Yes, my many many times we have come across when uh, my uh, uh, anesthesia colleagues in the same forum will know. Many times we have we were unsuccessful in reverting to sinus rhythm. Ultimately, resorting to only uh, rate control drugs. And even we had last week we had one patient who was continuously in atrial arrhythmia with rate of 120 to 130. We could never bring it back to below 100 for more than one to two weeks time. Ultimately, we even lost him uh, because of some other uh, pulmonary and uh, fulminant uh, pneumonia. But uh, this we could not revert him at all. His cardiac function is otherwise normal. He did not have any other problem. His electrolytes were also ultimately normal. Only thing is he got fulminant pneumonia in the background of uh, retroviral disease. So only that was a precipitating stressor, and we could not revert him at all. For almost four and a half weeks, he was still uh, 120, 130 heart rate. And uh, uh, aggressive drugs uh, only uh, deteriorated his hemodynamics. And ultimately, he was in sepsis and we lost him. And this is a challenge always, ma'am. Recently, we had a burns patient who had persistent tachyarrhythmia. Volume overload also was a reason. And uh, electrolyte abnormalities were more importantly the important reason. We collected electrolyte abnormality, but still AF, it was very, very resistant. Ultimately, sadly, we lost her as well. And uh, these are some patients who are critically ill and they pose a big challenge to cardioversion or pharmacological as well as DC cardioversion. Okay. So it, uh, if we have any patients with sepsis and burns, we have to be very uh, uh, careful. Absolutely, ma'am. Absolutely. Because there's a beautiful Aggressive volume person. correction in sep uh, sepsis or as well as sepsis. burns also precipitates arrhythmia, especially okay. atrial arrhythmia, AF. So we should be careful in that as well. Excellent. Thank you so much, Vinod, sir. You have given us a beautiful presentation and an eye-opening uh, uh, lecture. And uh, your, your PPT was spot on. Beautiful, Thank illustrative. You. Thank, you, Thank so you so much. much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we do not have any questions. If there are any questions, we can take it up in the chat box, sir. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Uh, over to our next topic will be, the, will be by uh, Dr. Vinod Kumar. And he will be talking to us about abdominal infrared facial uh, blocks. And uh, a few words about Dr. Vinod Kumar Ramachandran. Uh, he is an MMC postgraduate alumni. And uh, he is working, he's also working at Kumaran Medical Center Coimbatore. He is an anesthesiologist and intensivist. 
and uh, he is he is a very avid postgraduate uh, teacher and uh, he has huge interest in training uh, uh, bls and acls in uh, both postgraduate students nursing para technician i mean technician uh, students uh, as well as college student volunteers i'm very happy to see that he is uh, being doing that all bls uh, training for uh, training uh, training college students and uh, his main areas of interest are ultrasound guided regional nerve blocks and uh, anesthesia for interventional radiology and cardiology so over to you dr vinod sir dr vinod good morning everyone yeah myself uh, dr pranav kumar from medical center i am with you and i would like to thank dr edward johnson sir and the entire team for this uh, organized excellent uh, uh, online platform and for giving me this opportunity and i would like to extend my thank to all my professors and teachers of madras medical college and the medical center today we will see abdominal wall blocks why we need to know abdominal blocks here are the few important uh, uh, points easy to do with ultrasonogram uh, post graduate scan learn and do the block with ultrasonogram little risk risk of adverse events reduced opiate consumption in the post operative period and definitely alternative to the central neuroaxial block and it provides some uh, good analgesia as well as recent cadaveric study shows it provides some visceral analgesia also so another few important points in the last decade uh, increasing minimally invasive lab procedure so we may not require epidural always we can go with interfacial abdominal wall blocks and aggressive post operative anticoagulation regimen is nowadays increasing uh, so it is very difficult to manage with the uh, epidural uh, catheter in situ so we can go ahead with the facial blend blocks and the early ablation also possible with the <coughs> interfacial plane blocks these are the major uh, classification of the abdominal wall blocks divided into anterolateral wall and posterior wall in anterolateral wall there are three blocks usually we uh, do rectus sheath block transverse abdominis plane block and ilio inguinal ilio hypogastric nerve block in the posterior wall uh, again divided into three transversalis facial plane block quadratus lumborum block and erector spinae plane block uh, we are going to see all blocks except erector spinae plane block today this is a very important slide this is an innervation to the anterior and anterolateral abdominal wall the you can see here the sensory dorsal root ganglion and motor ventral root ganglion unite to form the spinal nerve the spinal nerve exits from the intervertebral foramen divides into ventral and dorsal rami ventral rami is the most important uh, branch for the anterolateral abdominal wall in ventral rami is again you can see here again divided into lateral cutaneous branch and anterior cutaneous branch lateral cutaneous branch again divided into uh, lateral and anterior branch to supply the lateral wall or the abdominal wall and the anterior cutaneous branch runs anteriorly to supply the anterior abdominal wall you can see in this image anterior cutaneous branch supplies a major part of the anterior abdominal wall whereas lateral cutaneous branch supplies a lateral part of the abdominal wall in the bottom of the image two more branches you can see ilio inguinal and ilio hypogastric nerve also supplies the lower part of the abdominal wall usually it branch it arises from the lumbar plexus but ilio inguinal nerve study shows ilio inguinal nerve consistently arises from the lumbar plexus block whereas ilio hypogastric nerve sometimes arises from the l1 and sometimes arises from the t12 branch also 
uh, is, you can see the muscle arrangements in the anterolateral abdominal wall. Hope all PGs are aware of this. All uh, three flat muscles, external oblique, internal oblique, and transverse abdominis. And the uh, vertical pad muscle, rectus abdominis muscle. And the here important point is arrangement of the fibers. Inferior medially, external oblique, superior laterally, internal oblique muscles. Fibers crossing each other. It is uh, very important to, uh, in, uh, I will tell you later why. And in the right side, you can see the reason normal clutches is there are multiple vessels and uh, involved in interfacial plane blocks. You can see superior epigastric artery, inferior epigastric artery, and deep circumflex iliac artery. When you, when you do a rectus sheet block, you can ch chance of uh, accidental arterial puncture is also possible because usually we may think interfacial plane blocks are always avascular, but the reason Norman clutches says there are vessels also involved in the interfacial plane blocks. Deep circumflex iliac artery, when you do inguinal, inguinal, inguinal nerve block and ileo hypogastric nerve block, you may puncture deep circumflex iliac artery also. So careful aspiration of the uh, careful aspiration before the block is needed. These are the major blocks in the anterolateral abdominal wall. You can see midline. You can do rectus sheath block in the subcostal plane, subcostal tap block in the mid axillary line, posterior or lateral tap block, and in the, just above the iliac crest, anterior tap block, which is nothing but targeting the ilioinguinal and iliohypogastric nerve block. Why we need different locations for the abdominal wall blocks? Here you can see in this image, uh, left side of the image, three important vertical lines, mid axillary line, anterior axillary line, and mid clavicular line. And in the lateral view also, you can see additional posterior axillary line. This is very important, why? Because T6 to T9, it means upper Thoracoabdominal nerves usually enters the tap plexus here. It means medial to the anterior axillary line, whereas lower thoracoabdominal nerves T10, T11, T12 enters the tap plane more laterally. And ilioinguinal, ilioipagastic nerves usually possess and enters the tap plexus just above the anterior superior iliac spine. So these are the multiple locations, nerves entering the tap plexus, tap plane. So because of this reason, we need multiple site for the, uh, to block the nerves. Common, all uh, interfacial plane blocks can be done with the linear pro high frequency, except Quadratus lumbar block, which needs curvilinear probe to perform the block. Uh, always uh, have with this whenever you perform the block, go with the standard nerve block tray, 22 gauge tumiplex or uh, uh, spinal needle, and drugs 0.25 boot weaken or levo boot weaken or 0.2 rope weaken, and always follow the standard aseptic precautions to provide the infection. This is a common image we used to see. Rectus sheet block is supraumbilical, infraumbilical. Uh, there is a difference. The posterior rectus sheath in the supraumbilical region is formed by opponents of the internal oblique and transverse abdominis, below which you can see transversal is fascia. Whereas in infraumbilical region, there is no posterior rectus sheath especially below the arcuate line, uh, only anterior rectus sheath you can see, which is formed by the all three oblique muscles. This is very important image. You can see the thoracoabdominal nerve enters the rectus sheath, anterior branch. As I said earlier, anterior branch enters the rectus muscle, 
the lateral edge of the rectus abdominis muscle pierces the rectus sheath and uh, anteriorly goes and supplies the uh, abdominal wall so try to locate the truck here in the lateral edge of the rectus abdominis muscle in the left side of the image you can see the aponeurosis joins to form the rectus sheath and in the midline it forms a linea alba the posterior rectus sheath is unsegmented so after deposition of the local anesthetics it spread easily more uh, cranially as well as caudally in this uh, zone anatomy you can see the two uh, in the posterior part of the rectus abdominis muscle you can see the two important hyperechoic line the above one is the posterior rectus sheath and the below one is a fascia transversalis so our idea or aim is to deposit the drug above the posterior rectus sheath and the muscle belly should be lifted up after the drug deposition so keep the uh, transducer in the transverse orientation either above or just below the umbilicus depend, depends upon the incision and uh, <coughs> you can see the rectus abdominis muscle and uh, in the right side of the image injection site is the lateral edge of the muscle and avoid puncturing the superior epigastric artery you can um, start from the midline you can see the linea alba once you keep the probe in the midline slide the probe laterally and you can see rectus abdominis muscle and the posterior rectus sheath and fascia transversalis and once you move laterally you can see the transverse abdominis starts to appear here is a how to do block needle entering from the lateral to medial direction you can do in the out of pain technique also uh, once you enter the rectus muscle try to reach the posterior part and keep the needle above the posterior rectus sheath you always check with the small volume of normal saline yes you can see two we are maintaining the two hyper echoic line below the drug deposition and muscle belly is shifted up the drug is deposited between the muscle belly and the posterior rectus sheath you can see the nice drug spread here muscle belly is above and posterior rectus sheath is below okay, 20 ml is needed for midline laparotomy uh, above and below uh, the umbilicus you can deposit each quadrant 10 ml of 0.25 boot vacan or rope vacan common complications hematoma peritoneum or bowel puncture which is immediately below the rectus muscle so always uh, uh, try to visualize the needle tip and accidental puncture can cause local anesthesia systemic toxicity but it is very less with the ultrasonography guided blocks so we have important tips extends more laterally rectus muscle than we think so always even with the dressing is on we can do the block Now always rotate the probe 90 degree and see the cranial and caudal spread. Now always use a Doppler to confirm the vasculatures. Somatic analgesia for the midline, bilateral injection is required, and divided injections superior and inferior to the umbilicus is provides better spread. This is very important. And transverse abdominal spleen block. <coughs> this uh, uh, various types. First we will see the subcostal block. It provides. analgesia to the t6 to t7 dermatome and some to extend uh, t9 and t10 also you start scanning from the zippy sternum and keep uh, the probe uh, parallel to the costal margin and uh, you slide the probe uh, laterally you can see the oblique muscles and uh, deposit the drug between the transverse abdominis and subcost uh, sorry transverse sub rectus abdominis and transverse abdominis you can see the linear semi lunaris where the transverse abdominis start to appear muscle you can deposit in between the rectus and the transverse abdominis in between the rectus and transverse abdominis you can see the drug deposition we'll do the uh, we'll go through the pre block scanning start from the zip sternum and move the probe laterally can compare the image and the <coughs> ultrasonogram image rectus abdominis after that the transverse abdominis start to appear 
and you can see the midline semilunaris and all oblique muscles will appear if you slide the probe more laterally to deposit the drug once the transverse abdominis start to appear near the semilunaris. Now you can see the block the needle is from the lateral to medial or you can perform from medial to lateral direction also. Always in plane is ideal. We are trying to reach the, yes, here you can see the drug spread between the rectus abdominis and transverse abdominis muscle. Elliptical shape is a <coughs> shape of local anesthetic drug deposition, you can see. You can visualize the needle tip also. Here is a drug spread of the subcostal tab block. It provides analgesia to the T6 to T7 and sometimes T up to T9, T10. But very important point is it will not cover the incision lateral to the anterior axillary line. Next, we will see the posterior or lateral tab block. Here, I, as I said earlier, the ventral rami is divided into lateral and anterior cutaneous branch. So, you perform in the mid axillary line to block before getting divided into branches to block the both branches. It mainly covers the T10 to L1, but sometimes iliovaginal and iliopagastric now missed because of the uh, anatomical variation. It may need additional injection. Um, in left side of the image, you can see the entry point. It is two centimeter away from the uh, transducer edge. Because you can, uh, in the image, always compare the depth of tap plane and take the entry point away from the uh, transducer to visualize the needle better. Keep the probe in the mid axillary line and try to inject the uh, local anesthetics in the transverse abdominis plane near the tapering end of the transverse abdominis. This is a pre block scanning. You start from the midline, you can see the rectus abdominis. Once you slide the probe laterally, you can visualize all uh, three oblique muscles external, internal uh, oblique muscles, and tapering end of the transverse abdominis muscle in the mid axillary region. Needle entering from the lateral, medial to lateral, or lateral to medial direction. You can do the block either in the supine or lateral position. You can see the drug deposition. Initially, the small volume is injected in the internal oblique itself. And you are always advance the needle uh, beyond the transverse abdominis plane and withdraw the needle and always check with the small volume. Once you inject the drug, try to reach the corner or more, lateral, more laterally to open the plane further. See, here we are advancing the needle towards the corner to open the plane further. So it provides better analgesia. So don't deposit above the internal oblique, below the, um, in between the, sorry, in the transverse abdominis plane is above the transverse abdominis and below the plane. In bit, don't deposit inside the internal oblique muscle. It provides somatic analgesia for the lower abdominal wall, T10 to T12 and up to L1, but it will also will not cover the incision lateral to the anterior axillary line. And as I said earlier, L1 is not consistently covered. Even sometimes after tab block, patient may complain plain because of uh, uh, sparing of L1 now, kidneys, additional ilioinguinal and iliohypogastric now block. Usual volume is 25 to 30 ml. Uh, there, there is a small difference between the posterior and lateral tap. You can see probe is placed above the iliac crest in both, but it is more laterally in the posteriorly in the posterior tap and drug is deposited near the tapering end of the transverse abdominis. Whereas you can key in the anterior to mid axillary line in lateral tap, deposit in the transverse abdominis plane. But a few studies source posterior tap block provides more effective and prolonged analgesia than the lateral approach. So, for the lower abdominal surgeries, especially cesarean surgery, you can do uh, after wound closure, 
and you can do in the post operative period if the patient complains pain you can um, again top up the block after 4 to 6 hours and if the patient is uh, uh, allergic to nsaids or opioid dependent you can do the transverse abdominal spleen block in our center we are regularly doing the uh, transverse abdominal spleen block it provides better and better analgesia previously obstetricians also hesitant uh, to uh, accept this but uh, nowadays they told there is a significant reduction in the overnight opioid requirement but always combine with the multimodal analgesia concept uh, with the paracetamol and tramadol if you what is dual tap and four quadrant uh, block it is for the both upper and uh, lower abdominal incisions you can it can cover the entire abdomen you combine with the subcostal plus either lateral or posterior tap block it is called dual approach if it is done bilaterally it is called four quadrant tap block so it uh, whenever there is a large incision you can go ahead with this important few tips use a tectonic sign to define the layers because in obese patient it is very difficult to locate the muscles because the interference of the subcutaneous and bad tissue uh, here in this video i will show you how to identify the cross fibers cross arrangement of the fibers you can see two trains crossing each other opposite and calculate your entry point to result in a horizontal needle tra trajectory and keep moving your needle into the corner of the pocket to open it further it provides better analgesia again in this video you can see arrangement of the fibers two trains crossing each other and here Finally, ilio-inguinal and ilio-hypogastric nerve block. You can see the dermatome. Ilio-hypogastric nerve supplies the uh, suprapubic region, inguinal region, as well as the uh, upper uh, lateral thigh. Whereas ilio-inguinal nerve supplies the inguinoscrotal region. Keep the probe above the anterior superior leg spine. It emerges actually ilio inguinal and ilio hypogastric nerve emerges from under the psoas major and runs anteriorly to the quadriceps lumbar muscle and initially runs deep to the transverse abdominis. After that only it enters a tap near the anterior one third of the iliac crest. This is the reason we miss in fifty percentage of the lateral or posterior tap block, so which needs additional injection in the just above the anterior superior iliac spine. can see the hypoechoic nerves here ilio inguinal ilio hypogastric nerve and there. sometimes t12 branch also we can able to visualize the near iliac crest and so in the video we just place the probe above the iliac crest and uh, you can see and compare the image and slide the probe medially we will try to get the public muscles you can see the hypoechoic structures crossing there in the tap plane this may along with the nose you can see the vascular structure this is deep inferior circumflex artery so always be careful during the ilioinguinal and iliohypogastric nerve block which needs careful aspiration before depositing the drugs and you can see the block keep the iliac crest in the vision because near the iliac crest the nerves entering the tap plane so here we may not be able to visualize the nerves but it is all not necessary always to deposit near the iliac crest that is a very important point if you deposit near the iliac crest you can easily block the ilio inguinal and ilio hypogastric nerve it also provides a somatic anesthesia for the incision in the right or the left iliac fossa it is mainly useful in the pediatric inguinal surgeries appendectomy and the iliac crest grafting and the use a a uh, low volume uh, 0.3 ml per kg because close proximity of the deep circumflex <coughs> iliac vessels what it is lumborum block was discovered by the is a posterior abdominal wall block discovered by the rafael blanco in 2007 a block generated tremendous interest in the last decade um, and they provide some somatic and some visceral analgesia 
multimodal analysis a concept it significantly reduces a opioid consumption there is anatomy it arises from the inner uh, inner rim of the iliac crest and attached to the transverse of the l1 to l4 vertebra and the 12th rib anteriorly related to the psoas major and posteriorly related to the paraspinal muscles cross sectional view see the uh, epimysium of the cuel muscle and in the right side of the image you can see the fascia transversalis as well as the which is in red in color and uh, now spinal nerve exiting from the internal vertebral foramen runs anteriorly into the quadratus lumborum muscles and enter the tap plane and you can see the internal oblique and transverse abdominal muscles uh, tapering end and forms the aponeurosis this is a very important landmark thoracolumbar fascia this is a fascia it's a complex of facial and aponeurotic tissue it serves as a conduit to the paravertebral space and it is rich network of sympathetic fibers mechanoid receptors so blockage of this provides a uh, good analgesia thoracolumbar fascia <coughs> divides into three layers anterior middle and posterior thoracolumbar fascia you can see anterior thoracolumbar fascia medially <coughs> attaches with the fascia of covering the psoas major and laterally the attached with the fascia transversalis you can trace here this is a fascia transversalis anterior thoracolumbar fascia attaches with the thoracolumbar fascia and middle thoracolumbar fascia uh, it separates the ql muscle from the erector spine as well as the latissimus dorsi muscle you can here is the lumbar interfacial triangle for the posterior uh, quadratus lumborum blanc you can deposit the trick here and posterior thoracolumbar fascia uh, attaches with the spinous process so what are the common indications midline laparotomy <coughs> infraumbilical procedures like tih and lsas abdominoplasty all renal transplant and uh, nephrectomy surgeries and abdominal <coughs> sorry iliac crest uh, bone graft grafting and hip surgeries recent study shows it provides analgesia to the hip surgeries also so these are different locations and types of blocks lateral is always called ql1 and uh, posterior is always called ql2 and <coughs> anterior is always called ql3 so ql1 is lateral you you can uh, deposit the drug near the lateral border of the quadratus lumborum muscle near the lateral border of the quadratus lumborum muscle actually the injection should result in the visible spread of the drug near the ventral surface of the quadratus lumborum this ql1 ql2 is <coughs> posterior to the quadratus lumborum and anterior to the erector spinal muscle in between these muscle you can do the you can deposit the drug in ql2 ql3 is anterior ql you deposit the drug in between the psoas major and the quadratus lumborum requisites for the block uh, standard uh, uh, stimplex needle 100 mm on our epidural needle and the volume for the block is 30 mm of local anesthetics and you can perform the block either in supine or lateral position but supine position for ql and ql2 block but for ql3 or anterior approach always needs lateral position and always needs curvilinear probe so important point in supine position always place the wedge under the hip to get a better visualization and for working space to perform the block supine position always in the left side of the image needle entry from the lateral to medial always follow this better avoid medial to lateral entry to avoid the vessel organ injury you can see the uh, typical uh, in some patients can see typical uh, google location sign ql muscle is <coughs> always hypoechoic and uh, frequent scanning we can able to identify the ql muscle this is the anterior uh, sorry lateral <coughs> for the lateral ql block patient in supine position place the probe just above the iliac crest you can see the 
QL muscle, hypoequiquel muscle in the Google X location sign and psoas major and the oblique muscles and the fascia transversalis below the transverse abdominis muscle. Here the lateral <coughs> or QL1 block, the needle is entering from the lateral to medial direction. Uh, try to deposit the drug later near the lateral border of the QL muscle. Mm. Here needle <coughs> entering from the lateral to medial, advancing the needle and targeting near the tapering end of the oblique muscles. In this image, it, it, we went more anterior. You can even you can deposit here. Here we went a little more anteriorly, but better deposit near the tapering end of the quadratus lumbar muscle. You can see the opening of the um, separation of the layers here. And then spread of the drugs towards the lateral edge of the quadratus lumbar muscle. So QL anterior block is otherwise called QL3. Place the probe above the iliac crest. Keep the patient in lateral position. This is traditional shamrock sign. You can see <coughs> three leaves, erector spinae, quadratus lumborum, and psoas major, and transverse process. A stem of the leaf. You scan from um, either anterior to posterior, or posterior to anterior direction. If you come more anterior, you can see the tap muscle. If you go posteriorly, you can see the traditional shamrock sign. Here now you can see that uh, tap muscles. This hypoechoic muscle is a QL muscle. If you go more posteriorly, you can see the uh, quadratus lumborum. You can see the transverse process also. So try. Here you can see needle, <coughs> needle entering from the lateral to medial direction. So you will cross the erector spinae muscle and try to reach the uh, location between the QL and psoas major, which is called QL3 or anterior quadratus lumborum block. Drug deposition you can see between the QL and psoas major. This is a subcostal approach. Uh, we can do either in the lateral position or in the sitting position. Uh, needle entry, you, we can enter in the two way, either uh, cranial or caudal or caudal cranial direction in the in plane or block the out, use the out of plane technique. Here we used out of plane technique. You start scanning from the uh, midline, the parasagittal, probe, place the probe in the sagittal plane and uh, move laterally from the midline. In the second image, you can see that a classical trident sign, transverse process, and visceral organ kidney, and the flat QL muscle. You can see once you move laterally, and above which you can see the erector spinae and latissimus dorsi muscle. Try to deposit the drug below the QL muscle. You can see the small psoas major here. Needle entering the uh, out of plane technique. You can see the needle tip here below the QL muscle and above the psoas major. Um, uh, you deposit the local anesthetics. You can see the splitting of uh, <coughs> separation of the muscle by depositing the, in the interfacial plane. Always do the uh, saline dissection to confirm the position and use the stumiplex needle. You can uh, avoid the intramuscular injection because the muscle will get stimulated using the stimuliplex needle. So in subcostal uh, sagittal plane, parasagittal plane approach, you can get the typical flat sign from posterior to anterior, erector spinae, QL and psoas major. And the drug deposition site. <coughs> And the complication includes if you advance the needle to anteriorly into the psoas major, you'll get a, a lumbar plexus block. Lumbar plexus will get blocked, and uh, some reports show uh, leg weakness or numbness also possible. Always explain the patient when you do the QL block and visceral organ injuries with the subcostal approach. 
and retrocutting element are also possible. So always QL tips, always scan of the transverse process in order not to hit with the needle. Uh, use a nerve stimulation uh, <coughs> to enjoy the needle tip, tip and uh, either use the anterior or a posterior uh, approach, but it is difficult in the obese patient. It provides somatic, some visceral analgesia to the T8 to T12 segment and always enter the lateral to medial direction. Better avoid the medial to lateral direction and always avoid if the patient is on anticoagulation. It is also considered as a deep seated block. So follow the standard central neuroxid block guidelines. Definitely take home message. Definitely it is an alternative to the central neuroxylar paravertebral block and it is a valuable option in infraumbilical procedures, especially TAH and LSH type of procedures and minimal or nil side effects with the ultrasonogram guided block. There's few uh, disadvantages, uh, less duration of the block, sometimes up to six hours, uh, sometimes up to 12 to 24 hours, but always needs uh, <coughs> additional uh, opiate recommends after six to 12 hours and cannot use as a sole technique for analgesia, always combined with the multimodal analgesia concept and uh, um, continuous catheter uh, technique. We don't have any experience and it is also complex and challenging because of the interference with the surgical site, wound dressing site and the chance of infection and the displacement of the catheter in the interfacial plane. So it is uh, always complex and cumbersome to do the continuous block. And But in future, the research is going on regarding the local anesthetic additives as well as the liposomal can uh, is increasing the duration of the block. And I once again thank all the uh, Dr. Edwardson sir and the entire team. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Vinod. That was a beautiful presentation. I see a lot of hard work behind those slides. And uh, it was uh, absolutely beautiful. Your sono anatomy, the entire illustration and all the videos were uh, very, very beautiful. And you have answered most of my questions in your last slide. I was about to ask you about the feasibility of continuous block to catheter. Um, you've answered that. Uh, one question which I have for you, which is the combination of local anesthetics which you would normally prefer? I didn't get you, ma'am. What will be the combination of local anesthetics which you will prefer? Usually we prefer uh, bupivacan with lignocaine, ma'am. Is there anything else when you were ropivacaine? Anything else? Uh, we do? used to give a point to ropivacaine also. But for the post-operative purpose, you, uh, better you don't combine the drug. Okay. And uh, calculate the dose uh, to avoid the systemic toxicity. Okay. And uh, this is for the benefit of postgraduates. You were talking about local anesthetic additives. Uh, yes. What are the additives which is uh, recently being, uh, uh, which is recent? We, we Any recent use, updates? Yes, we commonly use uh, dexamethasone, uh, 4 milligram, even 2 milligram, a uh, lot of studies have done, even 2 milligram and 4 milligram gives uh, prolonged, uh, equal and a uh, prolonged duration. We commonly use uh, dexamethasone alone. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Thank Vinod. So proud of you. That was a beautiful presentation coming Thank from you. Madras Medical College. God bless you. God Thank bless you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, Thank you. And on behalf of uh, Professor Edward John Winsor and our entire team, we would like to tell our postgraduates and consultants here that we are successfully completing our 50 classes and 100 hours of online anesthesia on December 25th. On this juncture, we would like a few words of appreciation and your suggestions and valuable feedbacks and how, on how best we can take forward this program uh, in the oncoming years. You can uh, message it to us directly or you can post it on our email ID, onlineanesthesia.gmail.com. So with that, that this online anesthesia comes to an end. Uh, thank you very much to both our speakers, Dr. Ishwar and Dr. Vinod. It was lovely having you here. And uh, it's, it's a goodbye from all of us today. Uh, online anesthesia sponsored by Acurella, hosted by A1 Logistics and Atelica's partner, Anesthesia TV. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much.